Okay, welcome. Thank you for joining me. My name is Jason Stevens, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Auckland in the School of Learning Development and Professional Practice in the Faculty of Education and Social Work. And uh, I've been asked uh, by character.org uh, to present this video podcast entitled Cheating Others and Lying to Ourselves, uh, the Role of Self-Deception in Academic Misconduct. Um, so thank you for joining me. Um, I wanna begin by talking about the problem of academic misconduct itself and this paradox uh, known as the judgment action gap students doing things that they, despite believing that they're wrong, um, and really how this amounts to uh, uh, cheating others. Uh, and then pivot to really talking about um, self-deception. Um, that is uh, how we deceive ourselves using what's known as mechanisms of moral disengagement, or more generally, rationalizations. Um, and in that, we're kind of lying to ourselves, right? We're saying, look, I, I did it, um, and I know it's wrong, uh, but it's not my fault. Uh, so uh, we'll explore that. And then we'll talk finally about about how we mind and mend that gap, right? Uh, it, it really helps students uh, pay attention to their actions uh, such that they act in accord with their judgments. Um, and this I like to call achieving with integrity. So uh, without further ado, let's talk a bit more about the problem um, and the paradox uh, underneath it. Uh, in that, uh, again, amounting to um, really cheating others um, and, and not just ourselves, uh, as we'll see. Uh, so first, just some numbers. Um, as you can see around the world, uh, academic misconduct or uh, students engaging in a set of behaviors uh, that we will call academic misconduct um, is uh, is quite prevalent. Um, if you look at just the bottom numbers there, um, that's overall number. So that means that students reported engaging in at least one of those behaviors, in this case, only five behaviors um, listed above, right? So working uh, on assignment with others is unpermitted collaboration or copying the work of another um, the sort of assignment or homework cheating tends to be the most popular. Um, there are, you know, important differences here across countries. Uh, but, uh, but if you can look at the overall numbers, um, they're, they're quite high everywhere, right? Where you've got minimum of, you know, 58% over here to as high as 90, nearly, you know, 97% um, admitting, right, self-reporting, um, engaging in some form of misconduct in the past year. Uh, and so, you know, well, why is that a problem? We're going to explore the harms in a moment, um, but let's talk a little bit about a definition. What is academic misconduct? Those are the kind of behaviors, but it's this idea of gaining or attempting to gain um, an unfair academic advantage. So we got the definition there from um, University of Cambridge in the UK, as well as one from, from Berkeley down there. Common to both of them is this idea of when I'm cheating, I'm I'm getting an unfair advantage ahead of for myself, right? And and then, you know, right? Um, and by definition, then um unfairly disadvantaging others. Uh, and, and, and that's where this becomes a moral matter, as we're going to talk about, right? Um, and when we talk about the judgment to action gap, we're talking about um, a gap between our moral judgments and our actions. Um, and uh, so many years ago, I interviewed a student and uh, they said, well, you know, I value morality. I just sometimes fail to practice it. Um, and what they're getting at there is that they understand, right, that cheating is wrong. Um, and that one should not cheat, um, but then yet um, find themselves um, acting in a way opposite, inconsistent with that judgment. Um, and so we call that the, in moral psychology, they call that the uh, judgment action gap. It's also known as attitude behavior inconsistency um, in, in social psychology. Uh, but in any case, the idea here is, is that judgment alone right? Knowing something is good or bad, right? That I, I should or shouldn't do it is necessary component of, 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 of ethical or moral functioning, as we'll explore that term in a moment. Um, but it's also insufficient, right? Or it appears to be in a lot of instances. Um, it's as if the judgment gives us some degree of momentum, um, but it's not often enough um, to carry us through, and that that's, that judgment can be, as we're going to talk about, be disengaged. That sense of judgment and the responsibility that might come with it, that is, um, can be disengaged. If we look at a concrete example from some of my own research, um, you know, I asked students to um, 
uh, in the past year, um, you know, whether or not they had paraphrased or copied a few sentences without citing them in assignment, essentially whether they plagiarized. I never use the word cheat or plagiarized in, in, in the research um, that I do and that most of us do. We talk about them as academic behaviors and we ask students, how often have you done this in the past year? And so um, what you're looking at is um, uh, the percentages there are the percentage of students um, that uh, reported um, doing it at least once. So 38.5% said they didn't plagiarize at all in the last year, and 61.5% said they had done um, some degree of plagiarism at least once. And then on the bottom is the percentage of students um, in, in a separate question. They were asked whether or not they thought you know, doing this kind of thing, um, uh, uh, paraphrase and copying sentences was a personal choice that, uh, you know, uh, you know, you could do it if you wanted to do it. Um, it was really nobody's business um, or whether it was a social convention, which was defined as um, it, it was something that was against the school rules. And the third category, and the important one for us here today uh, is, is, was it morally wrong? That is to say that regardless of the school rules, was this something that um, that one shouldn't do, right? And that's really kind of the definition of morality in a sense is that even if there's no rule or law against it, it would be wrong to do, right? Uh, and so, um, so as you can see here, most students um, thought it was a social convention that, you know, it's, it's wrong because the school says, uh, in, a, in at about a third though, said that it was morally, right. It'd be wrong to take somebody else's words or ideas essentially, right. Which is a kind of theft and represent them as my own. Um, now what you're seeing here is that, uh, you know, is kind of this equal odds thing um, going on, right? So those that said it was morally wrong, um, uh, about you know, half of them, um, uh, I say, I call it achieving with integrity, right? Um, is that is to say that they acted in a manner consistent with their judgment and did not plagiarize in the blue. Whereas these guys here are in the gap that we're talking about. They said it was wrong and did it anyway. Um, now, equal odds might not sound good. As I said, that you know, judgments um, are necessary but insufficient, um, uh, but it's a lot better than if you just thought it was a social convention. Right, you're two times as likely um, to be plagiarizing if you just thought it was a social convention, and three times if you considered it a personal choice. So again, um, there's some power in in making these moral judgments, um, uh, but by themselves, they're often not sufficient, and that's in the, and it can create a gap that we're going to be talking about. And what we're talking about here is integrity. Right. Um, and, and integrity, you know, that word gets thrown around a lot. So um, I think it's worth um, unpacking a little bit. And we can talk about it as this quality of being honest or somebody having strong moral principles. And that's a very good definition. Um, but the one that I'm really talking about and the one that I when I think of integrity is I think of this idea of integral. Right. When 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 one has integrity, there's a wholeness. There's not a division, say, between what they believe to be right and how they're acting, right? So words, beliefs, actions are all consonant. Integrity is, is at the heart of that intersection, if you will, right? And that's what it means to have integrity or to be whole in that sense. And we can see that that matters, of course, to character.org um, in this, uh, uh, the national guidelines in their, um, in their framework. Um, they talk about moral character and, and self-awareness um, uh, as being at sort of the heart of things, if you will, um, with their image and, and honesty, integrity, a big part of it. And this idea of self-discipline and responsibility, the performance character. And this is where that gap comes in. Right. Um, as we're going to see, it's a lot of it's about really taking responsibility, feeling the personal commitment um, to act on those judgments and behave in the honest way that um, that, you know, that you're supposed to. Right. Um, so um, I, I think this is a great framework for thinking about our problem today, the problem of academic misconduct more generally, but specifically um, this judgment action gap. You know, we need both the moral and the performance character, um, that is to say, um, to achieve with integrity. Okay. Um, so, you know, it, it's clear that when, when one engages in academic misconduct, there's some harm to themselves, 
Um, and, um, you know, for those who are probably, you know, listening to this podcast, um, uh, you know, you're like me and you care a lot about students' moral character and integrity, and we don't want them running around um, engaging in behaviors um, that they themselves judge to be wrong, right? Uh, again, cheating, you know, might be a rather small thing relative to other sort of um, immoral behaviors they might get into. Um, but nonetheless, I've always thought of it as it, 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 at the least sort of a, a death by a thousand cuts for character. You know, even those little small things that you do, you know, that you're lying, you're cheating, um, you know, uh, is is chipping away uh, at that at that character. Um, so that's a problem. Apologize for the typo up there. Uh but also, too, I'm an educational psychologist by training. Um, and so, uh, you know, I really come at this from a concern with a concern, too, about um, its implications um, for academic engagement and, and achievement. Right. If students are, are cheating, they're really not engaging um, uh, with the material itself and, and not learning um, to the fullest extent um, possible. So that's a problem. Um, but to be, you know, but to be clear, it's, it doesn't just harm the self. And, you know, many students will say that, and, and really that's just a, a, a rationalization that we're going to talk about, a mechanism of moral disengagement is to say that I'm, it's, it's not harming anybody, um, you know, denying the, the injury done. Um, but uh, it does. Um, and the, it, 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 it creates this unfair advantage um, that we talked about in the very definition of academic misconduct um, over those that aren't cheating, right? Um, somebody's getting an unearned grade, and that by definition is really kind of lowering or, you know, increasing kind of the standard, if you will, and, and perhaps lowering, you know, the grade or the mark um, that the honest student is getting, um, and when that's happening, that's causing stress and a diminished sense of capacity or self-efficacy, um, particularly among struggling students, right? They see that other students are doing better and they're, and they're, and they're working hard and, um, you know, and may, they may not know they're cheating and, um, uh, or that they are, but either way, it's, it's not a good news um, for other students um, and uh, uh, having this unfair advantage, um, you know, in the air. Uh, it also involves misleading others, right? Um, you know, we're, in a sense, we're betraying our peers um, as well as our teachers and misleading them, right, with respect to what we know or know how to do. Uh, and that's what education and getting a degree or getting a diploma or a degree of some sort of saying that you know something and you're able to do something. And when someone has cheated their way through um, their education, um, then they walk around with a credential or a degree um, that really misrepresents and misleads what they know and are able to do. Um, and that's a problem. That can be a very serious problem, in fact, when it comes to, you know, we don't want our doctors, lawyers, our nurses, our engineers, you know, uh, our first responders, um, and, and, and certainly not even our teachers, right? You know, uh, you know, uh, cheating their way through school um, and, and getting, um, you know, credentialed and certified um, to do work um, that they are really not competent to do. Uh, not, not, not to mention not to have the character to do um, well. So, uh, uh, and it devalues education, um, right? If, if it, you know, this gets into the point if, you know, if, if especially if others are seeing it, um, it's devaluing education and invalidating the assessments of learning themselves. And that creates a whole host of problems um, much beyond um, students. Uh, and then finally, um, you could say it, uh, I'm invoking um, the broken window theory that of, you know, that when people see other people cheating, <clears throat> it contributes to a culture of cheating. Um, and that's a problem. There's a sense of others are doing it. I've got to do it to stay ahead. You know, it's a cheater be cheated situation. And pretty soon, you know, the whole neighborhood goes to pot. Um, this is the idea with the broken window. You know, when you when you have a neighborhood that is you know, has some disrepair, you should fix up that disrepair as soon as you can. Right. Be responsive to it. And, uh, you know, and if you're not, then it's just going to beget more disrepair. Um, and so, you know, letting cheating go, ignoring it um, and the kind of um, benign neglect, as it's sometimes called, um, is really just begging for um, a, a problem um, and more and more cheating to come. So uh, those are the harms as I see them, both to self and to others. And, and of course, you could add to this list. This is not exhaustive. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this self-deception. 
Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, kind of one of these paradoxes, right. Of, of, you know, I know it's wrong. Um, I did it. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, I, I don't, I, I don't feel responsible for doing it. Um, and, and what we're doing there, we're, we're in, engaging in a, a degree of self-deception. Um, and, and we're doing so um, using what, you know, in, in the moral psychology or, you know, social psychology is known as mechanisms of moral and disengagement. Now, they're also known as social cognitive distortions, um, ego defense mechanisms. There's a lot of different names for these things. Um, uh, but in any event, uh, you know, they, they are um, mechanisms that are there to um, help us avoid feeling bad about ourselves. Right. Um, so this is, you know, kind of lying to ourselves or saying, look, I know I did this, but it's not really my fault. Nobody, nobody wants to feel bad about themselves. Right. Um, and uh, and so that's what these um, uh, mechanisms uh, right, are, are for. Um, so before I describe the mechanisms themselves in more detail, um, I want to sort of present this overall model of, of moral functioning that David Weingart and I um, developed. It's really based on James Rest's four component model of, of, of ethical functioning. And um, we used it for thinking about academic integrity and the domain of academic integrity. And, um, and we write about it in this, um, in this journal article, really developed for a, a seminar that we developed, um, mainly for secondary students. Um, it could be adapted and used at the, at the tertiary level as well. Um, but uh, it's the idea that, you know, if, if we want students to achieve with integrity, as we like to call it, um, then we've really got to work on all four of these components. Um, and I've talked a, a little bit about uh, some of these already, uh, right? This idea of, of, of awareness, right? Of, of noticing that, you know, that cheating has moral implications, that moral, you know, values or principles are involved in it um, and making a judgment, right? That, hey, it's wrong to do so. Um, and then making a commitment, right? Engaging a sense of personal responsibility or commitment. You know, it's my responsibility not to cheat um, and, and then ultimately acting on that commitment, right? And so that's the achieving with integrity. But you'll notice that at any point along the way, you can, um, you can have these sort of um, defections from the high road, as we talk about it in, uh, in the article. And, uh, and you get students saying, look, I, um, look, I see maybe there's some moral things, but it's just not morally wrong in this situation. The big one with the gap is this one here, is that they understand they, that it's morally wrong, but then say they're not responsible. They've disengaged that sense of personal responsibility and then go on to cheat. So that's really the, um, the the main pathway that we're talking about here. Um, I do want to say that, you know, yeah, we, uh, David and I have done a lot of presentations on this in the past. And of course, you can see the article that we've written about it. Um, but uh, I, some of the training we've done with teachers essentially is, uh, you know, involves kind of these sort of schematics. And we try to, um, each lesson is sort of, you know, uh, you know, driven with not only words but images and um, and, and resources of, of how to uh, how to how to uh, help students essentially achieve awareness. So we might start with you know using a um, a situation a hypothetical situation involving a, a student in this case Laura and a friend who's asked her to cheat um, and uh, and and we you know get them to students to sort of think about the situation. You could do this in your own classroom quite easily, right? You know, using a real, you know, a real recent situation or something from the newspapers or, uh, or just, uh, or just a hypothetical one, um, uh, like as we have in the article. Um, and we want, we want to basically have students think about that, think about that situation. And we guide them through a set of questions, um, which is meant to enhance um, both the attention to and therefore the perception of, uh, if you will, um, the ethical matters. Is honesty involved here? Is there issues of trust, fairness, respect, responsibility, courage? We could also add care, loyalty, integrity. Um, and so you, you actually have the students really think consciously about um, about a, a situation and whether or not those values are present. Um, and hopefully in doing so, you'll, they'll see that, uh, right? They'll be able to, uh, uh, to detect and appreciate um, the moral or ethical aspects um, uh, in the situation and therefore have this sort of moral awareness. Similarly, when we think about 
you know, the, the, the space between um, the, the, the moral judgment gap, it comes here, you know, right, where we, um, we've asked students, you know, right, that they make a moral judgment, uh, you know, right, that one should not cheat. Right. That, 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 okay, the situation has moral implications. There's issues of, 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 of responsibility, of integrity, of fairness here. And, um, Laura, you know, shouldn't cheat or help her friend cheat. Um, and, uh, th then the question is, is, is pivoting to, well, okay, you've identified what's right and what, sh what one should do, <laughs> Laura in this case, perhaps. Um, but are you responsible? You know, am I responsible? And what should I do? Um, and that speaks to, you know, right, activating this moral commitment. Um, and the key mechanisms there are helping students to really prioritize moral values over other values. In the in the case of Laura, you know, with a friend asking her to help her cheat, there's issues of loyalty there, which is also a moral value. And so the idea of prioritize or, or you know, the, the, or even if you're not doing it for a friend, doing it for yourself, the value of of, of placing, you know, moral values over personal gain right? The higher score that you might get if you cheat. Um, so there is it's sort of that mechanism of prioritizing the, the values, right, that are inherent in the, the moral judgment you've made. Um, but there's also the preventing side of it, um, preventing that activation of the rationalizations, right? And that, and, and that involves, right, resisting the temptation um, to disengage that personal responsibility. And we're going to talk about how that's done and big part of it is blaming others or, or the situation as we'll see. But in the end, you come out with this notion of like, I should not do it, right? It's my responsibility um, to refrain from treat, you know, cheating, even if, you know, a friend is asking me to do so, or, uh, you know, or I think other people are doing so, uh, or I might personally gain from it, you know, right? The, you know, right, those are all just sort of rationalizations, you know, that I'm trying to excuse myself and get myself off the hook. Um, so, um, so what are these mechanisms of moral disengagement? Uh, <clears throat> well, they really come from Freud, um, you know, Sigmund Freud initially, but really it was his daughter, Anna Freud, um, that wrote about 42 of them, I think she discusses in this book, um, called The Ego and, and Mechanisms of, of Defense. Um, and so, right, the ego's involved here, right? Because nobody, again, wants to think they're a bad person. When we do something, um, that we shouldn't have done. Maybe we've lied, we've cheated, um, uh, you know, right? We would we would and should feel rightly bad about ourselves. Um, and, and that's an unpleasant experience. And so, uh, you know, these defense mechanisms in a way are trying to um, help absolve some of that guilt and the self-recrimination that comes with doing something that you know to be wrong. And um, as I said, Anna Freud documented, I think, 42 of them. Um, and Albert Bandura, uh, and, and it's really his work that I lean on um, the most in, in, the, in the research and theorizing I've done um, about this uh, in this space, um, identified eight major mechanisms. Um, Sykes and Matza actually, uh, before um, Bandura, but after Anna Freud, um, talked about these as uh, techniques of neutralization. Um, they are sociologists writing, and, and, and that's still very much used in, um, in, in theories of delinquency, um, criminal behavior. And so you, you'll you see um, neutralization also used uh, in, in, in some of the literature here, um, especially that comes out of uh, criminal, you know, uh, criminology. <clears throat> in any event, um, so I, I summarize these in some way. They're probably they, the, the the mechanisms I'm you know labeled and and and, and articulated here um, probably hue closest to to Bendura's work, um, if not if not exactly like his. Uh, so one way in which we <laughs> avoid feeling bad about ourselves um, and can say that it's you know not my fault is by externalizing blame. Right, we displace it onto others. You know, my friend made me do it, right? Um, uh, you know, um, you know, or we can diffuse it, uh, right, into the into the whole environment or culture, like everybody does it, right? Um, we've heard that before in in various corporate scandals, right? That's just the way things are done. Everybody does it that way. Yeah, it's against the regs, but you know, uh, but everybody does it, um, and so I'm not really responsible. You know, um, I'm just going along, uh, kind of thing. Um, uh, if we're not externalizing it, we might be minimizing it. 
we can say, you know, right, that, yeah, no, I shouldn't have done this, but it was, I was just, you know, peeking at her answers, you know, uh, just, just a quick peek, you know, right? So that's sort of a euphemistic labeling. Um, you hear this a lot, and Vendera talks a lot about human atrocities and the military and the way that the military has a whole way of sanitizing, you know, um, the, the language of, 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 of death, right? Collateral damage, you know, right? Um, the, that, that sort of thing where we don't really call the thing what it really is in its most um, unvarnished and direct way, right? Civilians being murdered, you know, it's collateral damage. Uh, uh, and we can also minimize the wrong by making advantageous comparisons, you know, right? Uh, we say, look, you know, I just cheated on a test. It's not as though I killed somebody, right? You know, so we try to, you know, take an, you know, that's almost like a straw man argument, you know, you, 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 you know, you, you're throwing up some really extreme behavior um, to show how minimal really yours was in the grand scheme of things, and therefore excusing it. And again, we do this, these, these mechanisms we do as, as much for ourselves as we, as we, as we do for, as, as we do for others, right, when challenged. Um, but that's the way that they, there's an insidious thing here, right, is these mechanisms sometimes even operate at a subconscious level, right? You're not even aware that you're, you're, you're doing, it's a dialogue you're almost having with yourself um, in doing this. Um, so uh, attribution of blame, similar to externalizing of blame, you know, right? Uh, this one, typically, it's like about, you know, it's the teacher's fault, right? Um, uh, the teacher was bad and it, it, it's, it's his fault or her fault. Um, then, of course, there's the extreme denial, right? The ultimate ego defense mechanism in a, in a Freudian sense, right, is just saying that it never happened. <laughs> I didn't do it, um, right? Um, and, uh, and, you know, that kind of repression that goes with um, uh, sometimes when we're victimized, uh, that can be adaptive for a while, but unhealthy in the long run. Um, or there's a denial of victim, you know, right? Insisting that, again, that only, nobody, nobody, else gets hurt you know i'm just hurting myself if i cheat so you know no big deal um uh and then we have one too that's a really interesting one the moral justification where we actually invoke sort of a higher social good or, or goal or, or moral purpose you know that um hey this test was unfair and so i was just writing a wrong um and that you know my future is at stake you know i needed good grades for college you know, if, if I if I failed now, I'd be letting down my my parents, you know, right? And so I I've got to I've got to I've got to please them. You know, that's the most important thing. If I've got to cheat a little bit to do it, you know, so be it. There's a there's a greater good being served, you know, through my misconduct. Um now again, these things might not always be specious sort of arguments or claims or rationalizations, but um uh you know, but Broadly speaking, um, these are the ways in which we, we disengage a sense of responsibility. I put this last one in and read this dehumanization, which is a really extreme one and not one that really applies to academic misconduct. But, you know, you, you know, we live in a world in which there's a lot of atrocities um, happening, unfortunately, and uh, and. And, and part of that can be done, and we see that in political divides, you know, even within the United States now, but in other countries where certain people are really dehumanized, right? They're, they're, they're considered the savages or degenerates, uh, subhuman in some way, right? Um, and uh, and uh, that then allows us um, to treat them in a way that uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, that is, that can be you know, cruel um, at, at, the, at the least, if not murderous um, in the extreme, um, genocidal in the extreme, I should say. Uh, and I think a Voltaire quote here is, is particularly um, appropriate. Uh, you know, those who can make you believe absurdities um, can make you commit atrocities. Okay, so how are we going to mind and mend this gap? Uh, yeah. Uh, so I want to leave you with really a set of, um, a set of strategies, if you will, um, for helping students achieve with integrity. So uh, I've, I've listed five here, um, and they correspond with, with what we've been talking about. In the first instance, you know, making it moral, helping students understand that academic misconduct is not only a violation of school rules, it's certainly that, um, but that it's morally wrong. 
right? It's dishonest, it's unfair, it's harmful to self and others. Um, it's a betrayal of trust. It's a kind of irresponsibility. Um, you know, it, on you know, use the moral language and help un students understand it in moral terms. Again, that's not ne you know that's not necessarily that's not sufficient, but it is necessary to get it onto that you know that that path that higher road of moral functioning I, I shared with you, um, and that then secondly on that you know right is is helping them um, take personal responsibility and make you know personal commitments um, to uh, to act in accord with those judgments right um, so. You know, we 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 make recommendations in the uh, in that article I reference and elsewhere. As students, you know, either sometimes sign a pledge or read a pledge even can can work. There's been research that shows that these can be effective. That when students actually see a statement about, um, you know, a, a, an academic integrity statement before completing an assignment, they're less likely to do it. Um, and and minding that gap. Um, and I go as far as this is sort of, you know, called deliberative psychological education that I, again, talk about in that article with Weingart, you know, that, you know, that teaching students about these mechanisms, making them aware um, of how we, you know, rationalize our behavior, uh, uh, you know, again, this oftentimes the insidious thing about this, these mechanisms is they do operate at a subconscious level. We're not even aware that we're, that we're using them, but we are. And so really calling students out on that um, and helping raise awareness about these things and their, their purpose, um, you know, why, why, why we have them as, as human beings. We are, you know, we're humans, you know, and we do make mistakes and that's okay to make mistakes, but the idea is to learn from them and not do it again. Um, and um, so then along with that, right, you know, is rejecting those rationalizations. So, you know, teaching students to recognize, um, you know, the, the common and easy, as they say, facile, you know, ras rationalizations associated with moral disengagement, right? Oh, I was just helping a friend, you know, the, it was the teacher's fault, you know, or the test was, you know, unfair, uh, you know, any of those things that are meant to basically excuse behavior um, uh, when it really doesn't, um, right? Uh, finally, you know, creating a culture of integrity, you know, in so much as possible, we really want not only in our classrooms, you know, but our but our schools, our campuses to have a shared understanding and commitment to academic integrity, not only among students, but also, you know, teachers, administrative staff, and, you know, even, even parents or community members um, that are in, involved in our campus, you know, a palpable sense that this is a place um, that cares about integrity. Uh, that goes a little bit beyond, obviously, our time today. Day. Um, but I will say that uh, there's a lot of resources um, for uh, everything I've been talking about, um, you know, uh, several websites, um, starting with characterofcourse.org, but uh, the International Center for Academic Integrity, um, as well as ones about uh, there's a couple of articles that I found on, um, you know, how to stop cheating, your, you know, about cheating yourself and cheating others kind of thing. Uh, and then I've listed a bunch of my own, my own work a bit selfishly here, but um, but you'll see it's a really series of stuff. And starting with this seminar at the at the secondary level to creating cultures of integrity, um, and this how to cheat and not feel guilty, uh, right? This is about those mechanisms of moral disengagement and how we use those. Um, this is an empirical article um, showing that uh, you know the. the uh, yeah, the relationships between the judgment action gap um, uh, and, the, and the role of moral disengagement there. Um, uh, and, and a few other articles um, where, uh, you know, uh, that, that, you know, provide resources um, and frameworks, you know, so this comes from that a, a chapter on creating cultures of integrity that again, not going to get into now, or this article in Change Magazine uh, published a couple of years ago um, that you know, contrast cultures of cheating with cultures of integrity, and then provides a set of strategies, little things that you can do to help cultivate um, a culture of integrity. Some work I did with, um, uh, uh, you know, Tricia uh, Bertrand Gallant, you know, on when when students do make mistakes, have errors, you know, taking a developmental approach, so that way they really learn from um, learn from their mistakes, um, and the moral imperative to do that. Okay. Uh, well, that's all the time I have. I want to thank you for your time and attention here. Um, and I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, you're welcome to email me um, and contact me if you have any questions or follow up. Um, and uh, I'd love to hear from you and wish you the best.
Take care.